This morning, I want to talk about a worthy passion. There's a lot of things that we can give our lives to. There's a lot of things that we can be passionate about. And this morning, I want to talk about a worthy passion, and I want to do so by looking at our next text in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. You know that we started Matthew back in Advent, and we're going to stay in Matthew for a few months because Matthew truly captures the fulfillment of all things promised in the, New, in the Old Testament. Matthew is written to a Jewish audience and Matthew's one emphasis that you see over and over again is the realization of the kingdom of God. The kingdom that was promised in the Old Testament now coming to fruition in the coming of Jesus as the king. Now coming as Jesus establishes the kingdom of God, we see its fulfillment primarily in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 6 happens to be right in the middle of arguably the greatest sermon that was ever preached by the greatest individual who ever lived. Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is known as the Sermon on the Mount, and we find Matthew chapter 6 right in the middle of that passage. The passage in particular that was outlined months ago is concerning anxiety and worry. How the word of God is timeless and timely, especially in our cultural moment and the craziness of this past week. How do we need, oh how we need, a word from our Lord that was preached 2,000 years ago but speaks to us through the spirit of God concerning anxiety and worry. The word of God, Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And are you not more valuable than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the fields, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Can I get an amen? Amen. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord, no, the word of our Lord, it stands forever. Amen. A group of Christian college students was asked by the professor, what are some of the things that you will be looking for in a future spouse? And the professor said, I'm going to take Christian off the table. Hopefully that's a given. But in addition to looking for a Christian spouse, what are some of the things? And one young college girl said, I'm looking for a spouse with ambition. I want a spouse that has drive that has passion. It's interesting that she identified that characteristic in her future spouse because that's exactly how God has designed us. You see, God has designed each one of us, whether we realize it or not, every single person here today and every single person watching at home, he has designed us to have a worthy passion. And it's interesting that Jesus here in this passage, that on the surface, yes, it is dealing with anxiety and fear and worry. But Jesus in this passage that we just read is, wants to get beneath the surface and not only discuss and identify fear and anxiety, 
But Jesus here in this passage wants to go beneath the surface and identify something far greater. He wants us to identify the passions and the desires of our hearts. Because once we understand the passions and desires of our hearts, then we can understand who ultimately we are and what we ultimately live for. You see, at the end of the day, Jesus is identifying two passions that you as an individual either have a passion for yourself or have a passion for the kingdom of God. You either have a passion for yourself and for your kingdom or a passion for the kingdom of God. And so as we study this passage together, I want us to identify what is Jesus trying to get us to understand concerning what a worthy passion truly is. But before we talk about a worthy passion, the first thing I want to identify is Jesus talks about what an unworthy passion is. You see, for Jesus, he says both in verses 25 and 31 that an unworthy passion is to be preoccupied with your life. An unworthy passion is to be preoccupied with your life and with yourself. In verse 25 and 31, he says, why are you so worried? And why are you so anxious, worried about what you will eat and what you will drink and what you will wear, both in 25 and 31? He reveals that our natural condition is to see ourselves as the center of the universe. We are experts in being preoccupied with ourselves. We are experts at being self-absorbed. And Jesus puts it right there on the table. And he says, why are you so worried? Thinking about everything under the sun, full of fear and full of anxiety, as if this life and this world revolves around you. And then he says in both verses 25 and 31, this is the result of a a life preoccupied with yourself. The result is fear and anxiety. Now, follow me here, because this is an important principle that Jesus is trying to teach. The world says, you have fear and you have anxiety, then this is what you need to do. You need to gain control of what seems uncontrollable in your life. You need to focus more on you and less on others. And you need to revolve everything around you and your priorities. I want to ask you, the more you attempt to control in your life, anxiety go up or does anxiety go down? No, you see, what Jesus is trying to say, the more you attempt to control what you can't control, the more you become preoccupied and self-absorbed with you, anxiety and fear will increase. And Jesus teaches this important worldview paradigm that contrary to what the world teaches, When you actually relinquish control of the uncontrollable, when you actually think about yourself less, when you become preoccupied with something beyond yourself, then you will experience peace. And then you will experience true rest. You see the polar opposites of these two worldviews? You see, the definition of anxiety is this, attempting to control what can't be controlled. Attempting to control the uncontrollable will always lead to fear and anxiety. And this is what Jesus is saying in this this passage. He says, when you are preoccupied with you, it is such an unworthy passion. It is so small. It is so small of you to, to focus on something that is so small and insignificant. When you have the privilege to focus on the kingdom of God as your sole passion in life and you are settling with thinking about you and what is you are dealing with right now, he says it's an unworthy passion. And there's two things that he identifies here, the reason it's so small and so unworthy. The first is this, in verse 32, he says it's rather unbecoming. It's rather unbecoming. What does he say in verse 32? For the Gentiles seek after all these things. What is he saying here? Who were the Gentiles in this context? They were individuals that did not have the truth. They were not God-fearing people. 
Our equivalents would be non-Christians, those that didn't have the truth. And Jesus is saying, I'm watching you worry. I'm watching you filled with anxiety, my people, my children. And he's saying, it's rather unbecoming of my people and of my children. You're like the, those that don't have the truth. You're like those that have not been transformed by the gospel. You're no better. It's rather unbecoming of you for you to revolve your life and your passions around yourself, for you to be the central focus of your life. It's rather unbecoming. But Jesus says it's not only unbecoming, but it's unnecessary. Look at verse 26 and 28. He uses this example of the birds of the air and the lilies of the field. You'll see it in verses 26 and 28. And he uses something very mundane and very generic for a reason. Often things that we would go through our day, the busyness of our day, and simply miss. He says, look at the birds. Does God not provide for them? And then look at the lilies of the field. Does God not provide for them? What's Jesus trying to say? If Jesus provides through our Father for the birds of the air and the lilies of the field, how will he not provide for you? Are you understanding what you're acting like? Jesus is saying it is unnecessary to be filled with an anxiety and worry because you're acting like orphans and you're forgetting what it means to be a child of God. If he provides for birds and for flowers, surely he's going to provide for his children. And he's saying, stop, it's not necessary. You're thinking so much about yourself and so absorbed with you and your world and your reality, you are forgetting the truth of scripture. And that is why this church is centered and founded on the word of God. It's why we preach the word of God on Sunday. It's why we encourage you continually to get plugged into a Bible study or a community group because we know that out there your soul and your mind is gonna be filled with all kinds of noise that is gonna destroy you. And you need to, on a daily basis, be in the word, being reminded of the truth that no, I am not an orphan left by my father, abandoned by my father, but I am a child of God saved and rescued, and my God is sovereign and he is good, and he is for me, regardless of the situation. It is an unbecoming and unnecessary posture to live your life with an unworthy passion of being preoccupied with yourself. But then Jesus moves and he not only talks about what an unworthy passion looks like, a life that revolves around you, but he eventually talks about what a worthy passion is. And a worthy passion simply is a life that is preoccupied with the kingdom of God. A life that is preoccupied with the kingdom of God. And he says so in verse 33. This is what he says. But seek first, instead of seeking your kingdom and your desires and your goals, he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And what is the promise? All these things will be given unto you. A life that is preoccupied with the kingdom of God first and foremost. Jesus says, this is a worthy passion now, what is the kingdom of heaven? We're told in Jesus' earthly ministry that he went from village to village preaching the good news of the kingdom of heaven. You see, when Jesus comes, it is the arrival of the king and he is coming back. He has come back to restore all wrongs, to restore this earth and to, uh, to what God originally designed it to be. And he reclaims a people for himself through preaching the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. And how does he do that? He does that through us, his church, the physical manifestation of the kingdom of heaven. And what Jesus is saying is this kingdom, this kingdom that was inaugurated through my first coming and will be consummated through my second coming, that must become your single passion, not one of many things, but it might, must be the thing that centers and grounds your life. Nothing else matters. This is your single passion. What Jesus is saying to his people is, I must what? We as his people must decrease in order for Jesus to increase. One single passion 
a worthy passion, the kingdom of God. Now that sounds good. To an unworthy passion is, is focusing on yourself and thinking that this whole world revolves around you and a worthy passion instead is the kingdom of God. But what does that mean? What does that look like practically for you and for me? I wanna briefly give you some practical application ideas in which I want you to think about today and this week. And I want you to have some honest conversations, maybe around your dining room table, with your spouse, with your children, maybe just in the quietness of, of your day, thinking to yourself, what does it mean to seek first his kingdom alone? The first thing is this, the first way in which we seek first his kingdom and not our kingdom is living a life of kingdom-centered prayer. The first is this, living a life of kingdom-centered prayer. What do I mean by that? I've said it before, the, ma the majority of prayers, the majority of prayer times in the North American church is focused primarily on us. Our ease, our comfort, what we need from God. And there's nothing wrong with that. Jesus tells us that we can come to the Father with anything we need. But when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he didn't start by saying, pray for what you need, pray for your comfort, pray for your ease. What does he first teach them how to pray? Pray for the kingdom of God to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not your will and not your kingdom, but God's will and God's kingdom. And the majority of prayer in the North American church is focused on you and not on the kingdom of God. Seeking first his kingdom means we live a life of kingdom-focused prayer that God, you actually might make me uncomfortable and you might wrestle me out of my comfort zone and my life might not be one of ease and convenience, but if it is for the sake of your kingdom, let it be. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, not my will, but your will on earth as it is in heaven, kingdom-centered prayer. The second is this, we live our lives as kingdom-centered ambassadors. We live our lives as kingdom-centered ambassadors. Notice it says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. The word righteousness means justice. So it means every single day we, we wake up, whether we're going to school or walking onto our college campus or walking into our community or walking into our work. If you are a child of the king, you say, I am an ambassador for the king. And where there is injustice and where there is darkness, I will bring the deeds and the message of hope and renewal to that place. Talk about waking up with that excitement that my job and my work and my life is not mundane, that it is just not ordinary or regular, but every single person that calls upon the name of Jesus Christ, that I wake up as an ambassador for the kingdom of God, and I am looking for areas of darkness to bring light. I am looking for areas of hopelessness in order to bring hope. As I've said almost every single week, if there was ever a moment for the church in the midst of utter hopelessness right now in our culture and our society, it's time for the church of Jesus Christ to be kingdom-centered ambassadors so that when we wake up in the morning, our mission and our directives are clear that no matter what you've called me to today, the one thing that will remain the same is I will be an ambassador for the kingdom of God, kingdom-centered ambassador. So we seek first the kingdom of God through kingdom-centered prayer, through being a kingdom-centered ambassador, and then lastly, we seek the kingdom of God first by kingdom-centered priorities. The kingdom of God cannot be one of many things in your life. It must be ultimate. It must be preeminent. The kingdom of God must not be something that you check off the list, Bible study, going to church. It must be the thing that centers and grounds your life in order for it to be the central passion of your life. And I want you to do some soul searching this week. I want you to take out your day timer. I want you to think about your week. I want you to think about the way you spend your time, the way you spend your money, the way you spend your day and spend your week and ask yourself the honest question, does my life reflect kingdom-centered priorities? How much football did you watch this week? We can't squeeze in a 15-minute family devotion 
We can't spend enough time in prayer, but we will sit in front of the TV and watch football all day long. How much news did you watch this week? Which, by the way, please turn it off, that and social media. But we can't find enough time to be in the Word of God. We can spend hours filling our minds with all kinds of nonsense, but we can't find enough time to open up God's word and to get on our knees as a family and pray to God. We need to look and reevaluate and recenter our lives and our priorities to say, yes, my life and my priorities truly reflects the kingdom of God. So what is the cure? What would ever take self-absorbed, preoccupied people like you and me to say yes today on Sunday, January 10th. Yes, today I will focus on one single passion, the kingdom of God above anything else. What would it take? It would only be through the message of the good news of Jesus Christ to know the message that God, when he had an opportunity to rescue his son, on the cross had you and I in mind. It is only when we discover the message of the good news of Jesus Christ that he was preoccupied with you when his son was hanging on that cruel cross. To know that God is for me, that the message of Paul is true for me in Romans chapter 8, that God would not even spare his own son. Of course he's for you and not against you. And when you understand that God the Father looks at you, not as an orphan, but as his son and as his daughter, and is consumed with you, you in return can be consumed with he and his kingdom. Listen to me, there is no other cure in life. For a life full of fear and anxiety and worry, there is no other cure in life for your restless soul than coming home to Jesus Christ, where the restlessness can stop, where hope can be restored. One single passion seeking first the kingdom of God that we can stop this day, maybe for some of us for the first time, we can stop living like orphans without a father and come home and know that Jesus Christ restores us to God so that we can be his son and his daughter. There is nothing like giving your life to the kingdom, the place where you can become not an orphan, but a son and daughter of the king. March 13th, 2020, our nation goes into lockdown. March 14th, 2020, I go into my office right over there and I pull out this book. No, it's not a Bible, it should have been. It's my journal. And I start to write down for hours everything this church must do. Cut the budget, potential layoffs, I ask our executive director for every expenditure and for all the list of our vendors that we need to start cutting because this is going to last for a long time. O ye of little faith, talk about trying to control the uncontrollable. But guess what? I didn't have to do any of it. We didn't have to do any of it. Because giving went up and this church responded. And this church said, if the church of Jesus Christ is the hope of the world, then the church cannot be in peril, but we must support our church because it is the bride of Christ, because in the midst of utter hopelessness, we must show the world that we are not only generous, but we are hopeful beyond any other hope that this world can bring. And I salute you, Coral Ridge for saying we will seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I salute you because you said no, the church of Jesus Christ will not suffer, but we will stand up and we will protect the bride and we will show the world that we are the people of hope. Listen to me. It's the most beautiful thing in the world to witness individuals, young and old, who give their life to this kingdom. It's the most beautiful thing to witness 
individuals who give their life and they say, yes, I will live with one worthy passion. It is the kingdom of God above anything else in life. The evil one would love nothing to do in our day and age to distract the church of Jesus Christ. For us to give our lives to something less worthy and less glorious, to distract us in order to ultimately defeat us. So may we commit some for the first time this morning and maybe for the first time in a while that no, we, the people of God here at Coral Ridge will commit to the glory of the kingdom above any other glory, including the glory of myself, that I will commit this day on Sunday, January 10th, that I will decrease in order that he might increase. Because after all, what is the chief end of man? To bring him glory and to enjoy him forever.